very good morning to one and all indeed this morning is so splendid we are together here for another international event hosted by global research conference forum in the august company of eminent personalities my close friend dr p v anthony Dr. K. P. Hadi Najadi, sir, who is the founder chairman, Wisdom Global Digital University for Research Innovation, which is functioning in Delhi. In addition to the academic endeavors, he is actively engaged in the social service activities for almost four decades in Delhi. Very happy here with uh, Dr. Hadi, sir. Willard Korea, with a friend of mine who is engaged in educational innovation under Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Institute of Business Management and Skill Development in Kochi. More than that, he is actively involved in the activities of uh, overseas Indians. We Call them Pravasis. He is actively engaged in the uh, social and human rights issues concerning Pravasi of Kerala. Dr. Global Bashi is a respected chairman of Medicity and founder chairman of MR Foundation. In addition to the business activities, he is actively engaged in many charitable endeavors. Normally, people in business do not spend much time for non-business purposes. But Dr. Bashir is here in this program to grace the occasion with his gracious presence. In the company of many other eminent personalities, we proceed with the program. Our one or two chief guests, like Dr. N. Krishnagumar, Principal Government of College, Calicut, another friend of mine, Mr. Ramesh Kumar, DVSP Security High Court of Kerala. We hope that they will be joining us in due course. My job is to deliver the presidential address of this event. We all know that the importance of acting globally is increasing day by day. We use the term global. These days, the answer is the globe itself is being reduced into a single nation. People, cultures, political interactions, economics, education, human rights, the concept of liberty, everything these days is transcending boundaries. The world is not having boundaries in many ways. In fact, we will create boundaries for political purposes. Otherwise, the whole nation is a whole world is a single nation. So every activity happening in the other corner of this world is available in our fingertips. And primarily this kind of exercise should focus human issues concerning not only state or our own nation. Such academic discourses should focus on issues, challenges, and problems faced by humans everywhere. We have to be reminded of the fact that inhuman and degrading 
treatment anywhere or violation of human rights anywhere is a threat to welfare and liberty everywhere we may be thinking that the other side of the world is having some problem or our neighboring country is having a refugee issue or a military coup or a kind of communal right but we are happy in our drawing room we don't have any problem we are having the cup of tea with the newspaper and tank but such kind of a peace is not going to last because there is a saying it's just like a proverb that yesterday they have come searching the jews i was happy they didn't touch me come searching the muslims i am happy i was not touched but today they have come searching for me now my happiness is gone so something bad happens to anyone anywhere should be a matter of concern for everyone in this world especially academicians of our kind whenever we are discussing topics on environment economics politics human rights we should be keeping that point in mind so i will briefly explain what i have to tell you here in this morning human rights of the marginalized sections of the society i'm not coming with any kind of statistics or data analysis or that kind of a research paper this is largely consisting on of my opinions and my own reflections and my concerns so how people get marginalized when we take a piece of paper we draw a line on the left and we call it margin so on the right side only we write the left side is largely neglected the same way people live in the right side of the paper are important in the society and those who are belonging to the left side of the margin are called marginalized or we can say the deprived the vulnerable sections of the society how come some people in the society becomes vulnerable and what is the duty of each one of us when we witness such kind of vulnerability exploitation oppression deprivation etc so if you are not raising your voice you are at fault i can simply proceed with my presentation on human rights we all know that we are from different discipline background this event is interdisciplinary one so i have prepared it that way only we all know that the struggles against many inhuman practices in this world had developed the spectrum the jurisprudence of human rights revolutions and preachings of many many great philosophers like socrates plato rousseau machiavelli must have heard that voltaire the french revolution prophet rightly remarked that i am totally disagree with your opinion but i will defend your right to say that opinion till my death very very important statement about personal liberty criticism self criticism dissent and protest the basic pillars of democracy then we come across with people like abraham lincoln martin luther king nelson mandela many many such great men have developed the ideals of human rights and historical documents including magna carta which was signed by the british king in the 12th century and the ultimate document of the united nations the universal declaration of human rights 19 48 and constitutions of 
many world nations including our country have created the jurisprudence of human rights yet violation of human rights is rampant in every corner of the society the historical evolution of human rights all over the world has been focusing on the principle that human rights are inherent some people may believe or under the may, may be under the impression that human rights are supplied or given by the state or authorities laws are creating rights constitutions are creating rights international legal documents are creating rights but the human rights jurisprudence underlines one ultimate fact that human rights are not given by anybody to you it is inherent in every human being human rights are those rights to which you are entitled by reason of being a human being born as a human you are getting the right by your birth and the duty of the state and the society is to simply take care of the rights to simply ensure that the rights are not violated rights are not given but protected by the state and society laws and policies both international and domestic coupled with societal attitude have performed in a very minimal manner we all know that we have n number of laws to protect the vulnerable sections in this society but the vulnerability of the people are increasing their weight the promises and pitfalls concerning the rights of women children dalits tribal people differently able people the homeless people refugees etc the list is not exhaustive it is increasing day by day how can we deal with the issue constitutional safeguards coming to our own indian constitution we all know that this is not created on a fine morning our constitution drafting took more than 2 years many many world constitutions have been examined many documents like the united nations declaration of human rights un charter many more conventions and covenants have been examined and we have created the constitution which is the ultimate protector of human rights in this country article 14 15 16 and 19 14 everyone is having the clear idea which speaks about equality 15 speaks about non discrimination 16 speaks about equality of opportunity in public employment and 19 speaks about freedom freedom of speech and expression freedom of movement freedom of assembly freedom of association freedom of profession these are the basic pillars of indian constitution which provides for the larger the fundamental rights part of the 40s how we can see how they protect rights or they are supposed to protect i can say that only the rights of dalits and indigenous people one among the vulnerable or marginalized sections i have mentioned in the beginning they have brutalized a dalit man is beaten in the street in the name of cow or in the name of an any any other animal humans are beaten so how to deal with the issue and what is the responsibility of the society at large is the million dollar question we can see article 330 and 332 of the constitution provides for reservation it is also a bone of contention why should we have reservation everything should be based on merit and actually our conception about merit is a misconception a section of the society is given every facility to generate merit and another section is neglected all along and on a fine morning we are telling both the sections to fight with each other for acquiring the seat in such kind of an unique unequal for non inclusive society we need policies like reservation and affirmative action in the constitution assembly debates when this question was asked to dr ambedkar why we keep the reservation 
in the constitution when merit is to be given prime importance. Ambedkar has replied that reservation is a resolution for historical discrimination. A section of the society had been discriminated historically from time immemorial for no fault of them. So the society should, should pay the price or the society should resolve the issue or it should compensate. That is why we keep, but in spite of all these provisions, we know 338 creation of commission for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. In spite of all these laws and institutions and constitutional provisions, we all know what is the plight of Dalits and indigenous people in this country. N number of legislations, you know, Forest Act, Tribal Land Act, Kerala Scheduled Tribes Restriction on Transfer of Lands and Restoration of Alienated Lands Act. But do the indigenous or tribal people have sufficient land today? Sufficient land to live, sufficient shelter to live, and sufficient land to cultivate, do they have? The answer is unfortunately no. In spite of, I am not going to the details of the legislation. So, you know, about the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes run from atrocities act out. Many more legislations are there, but unfortunately, these legislations, these laws are very much minimally implemented. Now, another section I plan to discuss with you is, is the differently able people. Considerable part of the world's differently able population live in our country. By the 11, 2011 census, we know around 45 million is the world, <coughs> is the country's uh, is a differently able population. And over two thirds of the globally estimated differently able population live in India. We know that we are surpassing China in population, and the same way, our differently able population also will be the largest in the world. And about the rights of the differently able, unfortunately, in the society there is a there is a notion that. It is a charity. We are doing a charity to the differently able people. When a beggar is showing his hand, we are offering some money for his differently able. So the society feels that we are doing charity. And this has been in place for many, many centuries. And recently, the charity based approach is giving way to the rights based approach. Handicapped. The word handicap origin from the pavement of London Street, where the differently abled beggars were sitting in a cap in their hand. And from that cap in the hand, the expression handicapped originated. Very much demeaning expression. We have done away with the terminology and now we are addressing them as differently abled or physically challenged or mentally challenged. We have to understand the fact that whatever is provided to the differently able people is not the charity of the society, but giving them due share in the societal resources to which they are endangered is their right. So charity-based approach has given way to a right-based approach. The central focus of the approach to disability is the acceptance and enforcement of basic human rights of persons with physical or mental disabilities. Physical disabilities, we all know that there will be a representative from among themselves to fight for them. But mental disability is different. They cannot have a leader or a cruiser from among themselves to fight for them. The societal duty is larger. We have to raise voice for the voiceless. Now, the recent 2006 instrument of the United Nations conventions on the, on, on the rights of persons with disabilities, and we have also gone for a new legislation in the year 2016 
persons with disabilities equal opportunities protection of rights and full participation and that those three expressions cover all the objectives of the act equal opportunities protection of rights and full participation this is the duty of the society and working class the list is not over we know that the globalization or liberalization policies have created a notion that providing the rights providing the welfare measures to the labor or working class will reduce your profit and growth or development of industrial uh, production which is anti human because a healthy and a welfare oriented working class is very much necessary for the growth and development of any nation or any society and recently we have uh, almost we had around 40 plus labor legislations we all, all know trade, trade union act industry dispute act workmen's compensation act maternity benefit act many 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 legislations so so much complex was the legal framework in the field of labor laws and all these laws were violated by the industrial establishments with the help of the state machineries on a daily basis and we we have gone for four labor codes abridging all these 40 plus laws the industry relations code the so social security code the occupational safety and uh, the code of wages now we have instead of the 40 plus labor laws we have four codes dealing with all these issues but in the process of replacing the laws with these four codes many rights of the workmen had been taken away citing the reason of maximizing profit you must have heard of special economic zone in the name of industrial development inside these zones a large number of labor rights are violated people are working overtime with the lesser wages with no other emoluments or facilities or rights and unfortunately we should call them special exploitation zones so no country can progress without ensuring the working class its basic rights now women as another vulnerable group i don't believe that being a woman should make one feel vulnerable women whether women are vulnerable or marginalized but unfortunately the society had been making women vulnerable owing to many reasons in spite of the growing acceptance of the need for gender equality the protection of equal rights to women remains a distant dream in the society many 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 reasons we know adverse sex ratio female suicide high stress stress levels among women limited and unequal access to health care low level of education economic progress high level of atrocities against women the list is not exhaustive and women are the at the receiving end of many inequalities and atrocities in this society and traditions like polygamy early marriage in every religion we are not addressing a single religion i in my personal opinion almost every religion in this society is discriminating women please criticize me if i am wrong my personal opinion is that almost every religion is discriminating women in one or the other way and it is not in women's interest many things are not in women's interest against them it was inequality provides men with the maternal advantage material advantages and women with disadvantages then 
reforms and laws are very much limitedly uh, implemented, then wide gap in performance between the enactment of law and its effective implementation. There are many laws we know. Dowry Prohibition Act. Everyone is, everyone is heard of the act, but where it is implemented? Even High Court judges or Supreme Court judges give and take dowry in their children's marriage. Who is to implement law? Who is to enforce law? Who is to ensure the practice of law? Does dowry get prohibited in this society? No. But there is an act. Dowry prohibition. Like many such legislations. Many legislations are enacted for women's protection, but unfortunately, women are at the receiving end of many exploitative and atrocious practices in this society. Empowerment of women, we have to strike a balance, gender balance. There should be sex disaggregated, disaggregated data collection. There should be policies on literacy, employment opportunities, land ownership, nutrition and food security, etc. for women. So please stop me if I am breaking the time constraints. And convince men of benefit of reforms. Men always feel that if many benefits are granted to women, they will lose the control over the society. But actually, it is not. An emancipated and liberated women folk is very much beneficial for men also to grow. The society will grow to where we have saying that behind the success of every man, there is a woman. In the same way, behind the success of every woman, there should be a man. And without the gender discrimination, the society should grow. Then children, children also should not be a vulnerable section. But unfortunately, these days, we you know, folks or juvenile justice like many recent legislations, stringent legislations are passed, but children going to their innocence and dependence on elders are subjected to exploitation on a day-to-day -day basis. The study has revealed recently that in the case on, cases filed under POXO, sexual harassment of children, more than 80% cases, in most more than 80% cases, children are exploited or sexually harassed by somebody in their relation, blood relation in their household. So factually, the people who are supposed to protect children are exploiting them. We can see lack of social security, poverty, lack of affordable education, lack of parental education, lack of knowledge regarding basic rights, then children's own innocence and trustworthy nature, cultural crosses, causes and rise of informal economy. These factors contribute to the vulnerability of children. In mining industry, we know the children are employed. They only can uh, enter some uh, minute pits in the mining industry. And in the fire track case industry in Shivagashi, we know children are working in a very much hazardous situation. So there are many legislations, Child Labor Pro Prohibition Act, Juvenile Justice Act, and the recently passed uh, POXO, Pro Prevention of Sexual Harassment Against Children Act, many legislations. In the, as we have seen in the case of women, differently able to the labor, as well as the tribals and indigenous people, the laws are there, but violated on a day-to-day -day basis. India is home to the largest number of child laborers in the world with this ILO statutes. And child labor can be dealt with by addressing the root causes. Why it happens? It happens because of poverty. 
to power weapons because of unemployment, illiteracy and lack of industrial growth. So by giving some emoluments or incentives, one cannot deal with the problem. The problem should be addressed from the root by providing education at state's cost and employment prospects under state's cost, child labor should be dealt with in the society. Only quality education can ensure children stay in school. Ch school dropout cases are also very much higher in India, especially in northern states, villages, education and uh, basic health facilities are very much poor. We know. Children receiving quality education more empowered to, are more empowered to escape from poverty. And as a result, as adults, they are more uh, adults who are receiving education are more likely to send their children to school. So education is a key factor to be taken care of to do, deal with the issue of violation of child rights. Then we have another problem about the landless the displaced, uh, the refugees. Refugees are people going from one nation to another. But there are people who are internally displaced also. Many, many things like a uh, developmental project gets people displaced. Political problems gets people dis displaced. So, girls, refugees are inter and internally displaced face the problem of most complicated issues before the world community today. You know, the United Nations had been working very much vehemently on the issue of refugees by constituting in 1951 the, National, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And today the world has 17.5 million refugees an additional 2.5 million refugees cared for by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, that is, Palestinian refugees. Issue is that a section of the people say that it is our land. And those who were living in the land were forced to leave the land. You may be having many, many political reasons or historical reasons to deal with the Palestinian problem in a different way. But every child being born in that part of the world are suffering, is suffering for no fault of each. So the society has a duty to the future generation that we have to fix the issues created by ourselves. We should not transfer a problematic world to the future generation. We can proceed. The causes of the issues have also multiplied and now include natural or ecological disasters and extreme poverty. Recent Rohingya crisis also you have seen. Cultural causes, or we can say ethnic, ethnic causes or racial problems or political problems. The refugee is a person leaving his country and entering another country by reason of persecution. Persecution is a legal terminology meaning that a great amount of violence and harm caused to a section of people in a society. So people are forced to flee from nations. And people are forced to leave or move from one place to another within their nations, the internally displaced people. The Rohingya crisis, we have seen two, three years before what India has experienced also. Myanmar, the Buddhist country, which is known for its tradition of tolerance and humanity, Buddhism all over the world is preaching love, affection, humanity, care, tolerance, etc. But what we have seen, unfortunately, in Myanmar is the fleeing or persecution of people belonging to a certain section and they have flown to a place in Bangladesh and they had to face severe atrocities there also. 
India also had to take a stand. India was not a signatory to the Refugee Convention, unfortunately. Inter there was an international refugee convention and India has not, a, has not been a signatory to that. So India was not obligated, it was not obligatory on the part of India to accommodate any refugee. But as a nation known for its tolerant tradition and culture, we Indians also have a duty to accept and take care of the rights of people coming to our country. And these issues I have discussed here have not emerged on a single day. It is a historical process. We have seen violent revolutions or political uh, riots, communal riots inside and outside the country, the division of the nation in the wake of the independence and the refugee crisis between India and Pakistan. Our society, therefore, is one which has understood the value of liberty and freedom very much because we had been under the British colonial rule for a kind of slavery for more than 300 years. So we should value the ideals of tolerance liberty and freedom. The Rohingyans still are facing persecution or violence wherever they go. India's stand in this issue of rehabilitation of Rohingya refugees is still uncertain, but hopefully moving to the right direction towards upholding the nation's tolerant and considerate heritage, we should be, we should be taking an accommodative or inclusive stance. So the right, the expression right should be treated in the right manner. By protecting and enforcing another fellow person's right, we are not doing a charity. We are actually discharging our responsibility. So this way, I would like to conclude by reminding all of us that our job is not over when we are able to raise voice against violation of our own rights only. We should be able to raise voice against the violation of rights of people around us also. Being academicians or people engaged in academics or in India, our duty is so paramount we should be raising voice against the voiceless. It is remarked by our eminent judge, the former judge of the Supreme Court, Justice Vyar Krishnaya, that when you have a duty to speak, silence is an offense. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me patiently for this presentation. And on behalf of my institution, Central University of Kerala. I thank my close friend and chief organizer of the event, Dr. Prakash Dibhagaran, sir, for giving me an opportunity to be here to talk to you in this morning uh, uh, and be among the august audience. Welcome our chief dignitary, Dr. M. Krishnamar, sir, also. So I wish all the success for the event and wishing all of you a splendid day ahead. Thank you.